But tonight we're going to talk about <clears throat> when prayers are hindered. And I want to say, there are <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of things, <clears throat> you know, we live in a complicated world. And a lot of things can, can get involved in that, that when, when we pray something and then if things don't go exactly like what we prayed, there's a lot of reasons for that. But I will say there are two main causes of, of prayers being hindered, being um, uh, blocked, um, <clears throat> being um, set aside, sidetracked, whatever. One of them is the devil, <clears throat> and the other one is us. And, uh, you know, I guess... If, even if it is us, I guess the devil's in the details in there somewhere. <clears throat> but, you know, there, there's, a, there's a thing that we say. In fact, we, we sang it there in that song, Have Faith in God. <clears throat> Sometimes we talk about um, God answering prayer. Well, <clears throat> I would say God always answers the prayer <clears throat> but sometimes the answer is not what we're expecting. Or it's happening in a, in a form that we don't recognize. Well, this is, you know, it doesn't, the cause and effect of, of the answer doesn't seem to <clears throat> match up in our mind. <clears throat> well, now, we're going we're gonna to cover a few things of that. Now, I'm talking here mainly about prayer that is, is, is um, hello Steve, prayer that is um, righteous prayer as far as we know. I mean, there are unrighteous prayers. I mean, the, you know, I've told many times the testimony of when I was in Denton and I was in my backsliding period and, and, and we wanted to find some pot to smoke and nobody had any and, and so the, the waitress at Beck's there, we, we were there at closing time and and she, she came over and sat with us, and we asked her, well, do you have any pot? And she said, no, but she said, but, <clears throat> but my mom listens to this preacher on TV, and, and he says that if you just get an agreement for something, you know, if two or more of you agree about anything, it will be done for you. So let's just get an agreement that we'll find some pot. And so we all did, and then we hopped in my car and went down to Dunkin' Donuts, and there was a guy in there that had, had been a mechanic that had worked on my car. <clears throat> and, and so I said, hey, dude, do you have any pot? He said, oh, I sure do, back at my apartment. He said, bingo, you know. So our prayer was answered, right? But that was not a righteous prayer, and God was not the one that answered that prayer, right? I think we can we can understand that God's not the only one that answers prayer. But we're talking about we're praying to God and we're praying a righteous prayer as far as we know. And then it, it, it gets blocked. Okay, sometimes that is not the fault of the person praying. Sometimes it is. Well, first of all, let's talk about when it's not the fault of the person praying. Go to Daniel Chapter 10. Here's a classic example of that. <clears throat> okay, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. Okay, right there shows you one of the things where sometimes we think God has not answered our prayer, and he has, but the time frame he has in mind is he's looking at the long view of it, and we're looking myopically at the, the very short-term thing. Okay, the time appointed time was long, and Daniel understood the message and had understanding of the vision. And in those, and then Daniel says this. He says, "In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning 
was in mourning for three full weeks. And I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three weeks were fulfilled. Now, he was, he was intense in his prayer, and I mean, that you'd think, well, that, that ought to get your prayer answered if you're doing that. You know, you're fasting and you're praying. And you're so intent on it, you're not even, you know, shaving and taking, you know, baths and whatnot, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, now, on the 24th day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, uh, the Tigris, and I lifted up my eyes and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with a gold of Uphaz, and his body was like beryl. Well, okay, we know this is an angelic being. This is not a normal human being. His body was like beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes were like torches of fire and his arms and his feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words was like the voice of a multitude. Okay, this was either an angel. Uh, in fact, I think it does say that it was, uh, it was uh, Gabriel's. Uh, or, uh, yeah, anyway, go down to verse 12. And then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Okay, so God heard his prayer, right? But clearly, that's what he said. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So it's like the prayer was received the first day it was sent out, and this, this angelic being was dispatched that day. Uh, you know, like, like you, you, uh, you, you called in an order to Amazon to get a, a certain product, okay? And they sent it out that day. <clears throat> but three weeks have gone by now and you still have not gotten the product, right? There, there, there was a, a hitch in the, pro in the process somewhere in there, right? You know, that... The, some, the, some driver had put it aside in a warehouse and forgot about it or something, right? That, that's how that, that would be if it were, you know, today. Anyway, verse 13. But here explains what the hindrance was in that case. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Now, if this is an angelic being, then he's talking about an angelic prince of Persia. He's not talking about a human, human person is, it went up there in a spaceship or something and found this angel and said, no, I'm not going to let you in here. We're talking about spirit beings. So there are spirit beings that do warfare with each other. The, God's angels are fighting with the devil's angels. It even talks about that in Revelation 12, right? Well, that Revelation 12 is not the first time that has happened. Okay, anyway, it's happening here. For 21 days, but behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia, and now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now I'll tell you something. Even this afternoon when I was out doing my daily jog, I was crying out to God saying, God, what's going to happen? You know, what are we going to do <clears throat> you know, in the next week? What are we going to do in the next month or in the next three months uh, or whatever? And it's like, you know, I heard, heard the birds chirping and armadillo ran across the, the trail and, you know, and the, the sun was shining and everything was just kind of just normal. And, you know, I didn't, didn't get an answer that, that I recognized as, you know, Ray, this is what is going to happen. It wasn't like that. Well, that, that's kind of that's how this was for Daniel. And 
when the answer finally did come, he said, hey, what, what, the, the answer to your prayer is not going to happen, uh, you know, for thousands of years. Now, God is, I, I don't, I mean, we're, we know from the scriptures that what God says the latter days, that we're in those latter days because he gave us some markers what those latter days are going to look like. But see, the point is, the, the ruler spirits in the heavenlies interfered with Daniel getting the answer to his prayer. And he was praying a righteous prayer. Uh, let's go to the New Testament. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 verse 20. Is that right? I guess so. Well, I, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go there. Uh, Romans 15, verse 20. And so, I, Paul is saying, I made it my aim to preach the gospel where Christ, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. For it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see and to those who have not heard shall understand. And for this reason, I have also been much hindered in coming to you. So, why do you suppose the devil is hindering him? Because he's going to go preach the gospel somewhere where it hadn't been preached before. And uh, the devil doesn't want that to happen. First uh, Thessalonians, here's another example of this. You know, it's like I remember a person once told me, what the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is, you're not going to say speaking in tongues. It's trouble. You know, because, because if you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like uh, June Joyner, the little old lady that was a waitress at Old South Pancake House that also was the piano player at the, the sanctuary where Jerry Black was going to church at the time. And when I came back from France and, Set, went into Old South Pancake House. She came and waited on me, and she said, wow, you look different. And I said, well, I, I recommitted my life to Jesus and gave, gave her a little bit of the testimony about going to France and so forth. And she said, well, I'll tell you one thing. If Once you get spirit-filled, you better get with the program because God isn't going to leave you alone. Uh, in, anyway, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Um, Paul says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectu effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. So you see, it wasn't just an ethnic or a racial or a cultural thing. It is a spiritual thing. An antichrist spirit is, is pan-cultural. Pan it's... it's uh, you know, it covers all, all races. It, it'll work in, in, in any place an antichrist spirit will to try to oppose the gospel. And that's what he's saying here was happening. And it said uh, that the Jews, uh, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they, they do not uh, please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But you see up there in verse 14, he's saying, uh, you know, your Gentile rulers are doing the same thing. So you can't just blame, you know, it's not, the Jews are not the problem, it's antichrist spirits are the problem. Okay. But that's when 
that's when the person praying, as far as we can tell, is doing everything right. I mean, Apostle Paul, he was doing everything right. I mean, we do see one or two instances where you think, yeah, I think he missed God there. Like the time that, that he got hauled before the, uh, the Sanhedrin and, and uh, uh, you know, he said something that they didn't like and so the chief priest said, go hit him in the mouth. And so the, the attendant went and did that and Paul said, well, well the Lord's going to strike you, you whited wall. And, and said, wait a minute, you're talking to the high priest there. And, he, and so he kind of said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I repent. The, the word says you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> So he wasn't perfect. Jesus was perfect, but Paul wasn't perfect. But certainly in, in Romans and in Thessalonians, the opposition that his ministry was getting was not because he was doing something wrong. It was because he was doing something right. So if, if your prayers are hindered, that does not mean you are doing something wrong. But it could. And so that's what we'll talk about next. Go to James chapter 1. And one of the reasons, one of the obvious reasons, but not the only reason, why a person can pray and their prayer is hindered, is if they don't really believe that they're going to get an answer for what they pray. They pray, but think, oh, I'll pray, but this isn't, that isn't going to do any good. Well, <laughs> you have just wasted a lot of energy there. You wasted energy for your prayer, and then you wasted some more energy uh, counteracting your prayer with your doubt. You know, it'd be better just to just sit there. <laughs> you know, you'd be, you'd be back where you... You know, you're going to end up back at, at uh, the starting point anyway. It would be better not to have, have you know, put, you know, 10, 10 ergs of energy positive and then put 10 ergs of energy negative back to put you where you started. That's what happens, see, and that's what he's talking about here. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, I lack wisdom, okay, let him ask God, well, that's prayer, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. That tells you God will answer prayer. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get the answer you like. And that doesn't mean your prayer might not be hindered. But God does intend to answer prayer. He said he gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. See, you know, think of the last time you were at the beach. You know, the wave comes up and all of the seashells go. <laughs> and then what does it do? It recedes, right? He's saying, okay, you put your prayer out. The wave comes out and then, and if you're doubting, it's like it just goes back again. I'm sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away, right? Okay, anyway. Um, verse 7 said, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded, unstable in his ways. <clears throat> See, if you're, if you're praying and then doubting your prayers, <clears throat> that is a... An uncomfortable, that is a, an unstable, a, 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 an unhappy place to be. So that's one. That's not the only one, though. In James, go to James chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll read this in the Amplified. Verse 2 it says, You're jealous and covet what others have, and your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. To hate is to murder as far as your heart's concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification uh, that you seek. So you fight in war. That's the way human beings are. They're covetous, right? And it says you do not have <clears throat> because you do not ask. 
Or you do ask God for what you want, but you fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose and evil selfish motives. Your intention is when you get what you desire is to spend it on sensual pleasure. Now, it doesn't say that what you're asking for was wrong, but it says your motive was wrong. And it and also implies there that the, the reason even why you're wanting that thing is because you see somebody else with it and you think, well, why should they have it and me not have it? You know, that's... Uh, there's spiritual versions of that. You know, sometimes you can see somebody that's, that God has blessed in some kind of way, and you say, well, God, that's not fair. You're, they're blessed, and I'm, I'm not, so I, I want what they've got. Well, I guess you could do worse, but that's not really the way to go about that because you're still, it's still selfish, right? You're not... You're not praying for that blessing because you want to fulfill God's purpose in your life and you want to be useful to the kingdom of God and this and that. You're wanting to compete with that person. And there, there's spiritual competition. There's spiritual envy that can happen too. And, you know, this might be talking about coveting their Cadillac or coveting their money or their mansion or whatever, or it could be Coveting the blessings of God in their life. Either way, that, that motive will block you from getting what you want. Right? Okay, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. This kind of goes here in 1 Peter, kind of goes along with that there in James about the, the selfishness but it, um, it kind of focuses in on, on one other thing here. Now, first of all, let me say, uh, if in, the, in the verse, the first verse we're going to read here, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, it is addressing husbands regarding their wives. But I do believe that the principle apply that the principle is um, applies to men and women equally, because the principle is not is not um, gender specific. Even though that you know what he's saying, who he's talking to here is to people of the masculine gender regarding the way that they treat their wives. I believe this is really talking about a, a human behavior principle. It, how we treat each other, whoever we are. Uh, anyway, let me just read it. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with your wives with understanding. Well, you know, we ought to dwell with our next door neighbors with understanding. Right? We ought, we ought to dwell with our uh, nephews or whoever with understanding. Right? Okay, dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, but being heirs together of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Uh, in, keep the place here in Colossians chapter 3. It's even more pointed than that uh, regarding husbands and wives. And, Colossians 3, verse 19. In the Amplified Bible, it says, Husbands, love your wives, be affectionate and sympathetic with them, and do not be harsh or bitter or resentful toward them. Well, again, I mean, a, a wife can be bitter and resentful toward her husband, too, and God's not saying, well, I'm okay with that. I just don't want the husband to be bitter toward the wife. No, he doesn't want people to be bitter. Because he says in Hebrews chapter 12, and let me say, we are living in an hour where there is a lot of free-floating bitterness out there. 
People are bitter about politics. People are bitter about um, money. People are bitter about um, just the way life is these days. And in Hebrews 12, verse 15, in the Amplified again, it says, Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another. See, if all you're doing is grumbling and complaining about somebody else, you're not looking, you're not, you don't have their best interest in mind, do you? It says, so see to it that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace. It doesn't say fails to secure God's judgment. It says God's grace. In order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoot forth and cause trouble and bitter torment, and many become contaminated and defiled by it. So see, when there is bitterness uh, in a person, you know, this is not a case where, well, it just affects me. It will affect the person who is bitter, but that spills over and affects other people too. Anyway, go back to uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, a person say, well, okay, but I'm not doing evil. I mean, I, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to live a Christian life, but it's their fault. Whoever they is, you know, it might be the Democrats or, you know, it might be Antifa or it might be uh, Dr. Fauci or somebody, you know, whatever. I mean, you, can, you fill in the blank there. I'm not suggesting you be bitter toward any of those people, but... Um, Sometimes we, we think we're doing better than we're really doing. And I'm not saying that we need to, to get into condemnation, but if we, don't, if we don't face our shortcomings, uh, the devil blocks our prayers. You know, over there in Revelation 12, I, I mentioned that a minute ago, it says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, accusing them before the throne of God night and day. Well, what that tells us, that tells us several things. It tells us, first of all, that Christians are his target. And that just because you're a Christian, uh, you know, there, there are those who say, well, if you're covered by the blood of Jesus, then, uh, you know... Um, you know, all your sins are forgiven, and so, you know, just walk, in, walk in, in freedom before God. Well, okay, I think most of the time you can safely do that. But if, if you are, if, if something's not right in you, you need to admit it to God, and you need to admit it to yourself. Now, God knows it already, but you admitting it to God... Um, overrules the devil's accusation against you. Because, see, sometimes the devil knows some things about us that we're not willing to face in ourselves. And if he's bringing that before God and we're not, we don't own up to it, then that blocks our prayer. Okay, let me give you an example of this. Go to Psalm 66.
Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now that doesn't mean that, that the sound doesn't come to the ears of the Lord because he's, he's omniscient. He knows all things. But it means he's not going to uh, give audience to you. He, he's not going to, to um, you know, hear your case. The, you know, he, you, 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 uh, you know, you're making your case before God and the, and the devil's accusing you and, and he's overruling what you're saying because you have, as it says, regarded iniquity in your heart. Well, I think there's a better way to understand that, what he's talking about there, than, than if we just took each one of those words and looked them up in Strong's Concordance. To regard iniquity in your heart means that there is some kind of sin or some kind of selfishness in us that we're cherishing, that we're, we're holding that close to ourselves, that, that it's like, well, that's, that's just the way I am. You know, I've got a lot of stuff like that. Well, that's just the way I am. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm regarding iniquity. And if, if that, just the way I am, is not something that God, if, if that's not the way Jesus is, then I don't need to be clinging to that, do I? All right, and if you want to cling to that while you're standing before Almighty God, you are giving the devil an opportunity to block your prayers. You know, it is, and I don't care who says to the contrary, if you know that there's something that's not right in you, tell God that you know that. That will get rid of the devil's right to block your prayers. Can you say amen, somebody? Okay, let's keep reading though. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. So go to Philippians chapter 2. As I said, this is really, we're really approaching this from, from a very general uh, standpoint. There's all kinds of situations and all kinds of prayers and life is complicated and um, I'm not proposing some kind of magic formula for anybody to get your prayer answered. But looking at, at what God wants us to do and how he wants us to be and how he wants us to live. There are several things he says that I believe will certainly um, in, enhance the, uh, the uh, receptivity of, of, of our prayer and keep it from being hindered. And, and one of these things here is in Philippians 2 verse 12. Let me read this in the Amplified. It says, Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but also because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, which is self-distrust. You know, if, if you're trusting in yourself, then that, that, that again is something that, that the devil can use to block your prayer. With serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God or discredit the name of Christ, not in your own strength. See, that's something else. If we try to, to live the Christian life uh, through our fleshly uh, natural abilities or something, well, again, the devil can use that to block our prayers. You know, we have to give it all to God. When we pray and, and we ask him to do something, then we don't go starting to use our hand and our mouth and our wits and whatnot to make that prayer come to pass because we, we ask God to do it, right? 
I mean, if you can do it yourself, you don't need to ask God to do it, right? Okay, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. You know, I, sometimes it's hard for me to believe that, but Ray, believe that. God is at work in me, okay? Effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. And do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God or questioning and doubting among yourselves. And in fact, that, that questioning and doubting, the word actually in Greek is dialog dialogimos, which literally means debating. You know, I mean, okay, it's, it's one thing to ask, God, I don't understand. Will you explain this to me? But, uh, you know, once, once God has, has told you something and then you want to argue with it, well, again, that's blocking your answer to your prayer. Okay, verse 15, that you may show yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated. That's when we get our prayers answered. Children of God without blemish. This is where God wants us to, to get to. And, and I'm not there yet, and I don't know anybody that is, but this is where he's taken us. Without blemish, faultless, unrebukable, in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation. Amen, Brother Ben, with the right brother's pen. A, a crooked and wicked generation among whom you are seen as bright lights, uh, Stars are beacons shining out clearly in the dark world, holding out to it and offering the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may have something of which to exultantly rejoice and glory in that I did not run my race in vain or spend my labor for no purpose. Let me give you one more uh, thing that we can do. Go to Matthew chapter 6. It kind of goes along with <clears throat> that one about being, you know, being willing to, uh, to admit uh, our shortcomings. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 5. It says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. He doesn't say they get the prayers answered. He said, but, but really... They're not so much interested in the answer to their prayer as they're interested in people seeing them praying. So what he's saying there, don't put on the show. It says, but you, <clears throat> when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Right? It's a person, a very personal thing. It, it's, it's a quiet thing. It's in your room. You know, it, it, that, it, it can even be, I know there's those that say, well, you really need to speak out loud so you can hear what you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, we live in a noisy world. I, I guess that's sometimes a good idea. But, you know... You can pray just, just in your mind. You, you can do that. I know there's a song that we used to do as a special years ago. Jesus is no further than a thought away. And so sometimes going into your closet uh, is just, just getting away from the, the noise and the hustle and bustle and hubbub of the world and just shut, shut all of that out and just get quiet before the Lord. That's why I like to go out and jog every day. You know, because I can hear the... 
to the birds and, and, and I can, you know, I can pray in tongues quietly and then I can just listen and see if God's talking to me and sometimes I hear things and sometimes I don't. But that's, that's, my, that's my, my closet. Okay, so I hope this series on prayer <clears throat> has been of some help. I mean, it's not like you've never heard sermons on prayer before. <clears throat> but I, I will have to say, for me personally, uh, this study has been uh, very edifying because I've, I've seen a lot of, of things uh, that I, I had not seen before. So, Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that, that you are perfecting all things that concern you and all things in us that concern you. And so, Father, I thank you that uh, your will will be done and it's not our will, but your will that, that we want to be done. And I thank you, Father, that, uh, that sometimes you tell us just to, to stand still and, and see your salvation. And, and sometimes you do give loud, clear, specific uh, directions and answers. But, but that we need to be flexible in our relationship with you and, and not not come to you full of preconceived ideas, but, but to recognize that just like any other relation, that it's you, God, you, are, you have a personality. Uh, you, you have a, a mind, a will, and, and feelings, and, and you have thoughts. You said you know the thoughts that you have for us, and, and that they are thoughts of peace and well-being in our final outcome. 